especially true on the farm, where so many variables must be included in the planning. at Purdue addressed themselves to this problem. The first steps were taken at an interdisciplinary meeting. There were entomologists, agronomists, meteorologists, engineers, economists, and computer people. Well, if we can pool the technical and economic data from each of our departments, would it be possible to put this in a linear equation? Yes, if this group can define the problem to be solved, we can program it. Good, then what we need to do is describe the crops, the weather, the seed, fertilizer, chemical, machinery, money, cost of money, time, all these things. The man who just spoke is Dr. Howard Doster, agricultural economist at Purdue, a man who has helped farmers with questions of machine size and timeliness of farm operations. Productivity. Many factors account for the unquestioned productivity leadership of North American agriculture. Improvements in seed production, chemicals, fertilizer, all coupled with effective farm management, have made it possible for our people to enjoy the best food at the lowest percentage of their income at any time in the known world. Horsepower is a good index of productivity. I think we can all agree that the amount of productivity or work accomplished with this type of system is tremendously different from the amount of work accomplished with this system. Both require the services and skill of one man. Once a person has determined that farming is to be his business, he's interested in obtaining the most profit from the resources that he commits to that business his land, himself, his machinery, his capital, and so forth. In terms of land, he's interested in how much he should own, how much he should rent. Is it available? In terms of labor, he looks at questions such as, should he hire part-time labor, full-time labor? Is there a son coming into the business? In terms of machinery, he's interested in its cost and just how much he should combine with his labor and his land, his other resources. Here is an example of that point. Millard and Steve Egg farmed together near Fairland, Indiana. In 1965, when Mel and I started farming together, we farmed approximately 600 acres. And now we have about 1,500 acres in row crop. I think during this transition, our machinery cost per acre-wise has not increased stayed about the same. And the labor force has stayed about the same overall. So consequently, the two families of us could live off of what we're doing now if we did not have the large machinery. I don't think this would be possible. More acres now that you can handle together, more profits in terms of, at least in terms of number of acres, to spread over just the two families. That's right. right. Let's return to machinery. What does it cost? Really, what does it do? Our research here at Purdue has shown us that if we operate a small machine and a larger machine, the same number of hours, the machinery cost per acre will be the same. Obviously, the man on the larger machine 
for a bit more acres than the man on the small machine. In my own field of education, I have a choice. If I want to do some farm planning on a one-time basis, I can use a pencil, or I can use a desk calculator, or if it's a kind of question that I'm likely to study several times, we can write a computer program. Now let's turn to the task of sizing machinery for a particular acreage and farm. Two factors which affect this are yields as affected by date of planting and time available for field work. Everyone starts with the same amount of time. The time you have available depends on several factors. To find out how many days are really suitable for field work, let's ask Dr. Earl Park, agricultural statistician, U.S. Crop Reporting Service. We have a wealth of data which has been collected weekly over a 21-year period. This is one of our earlier books that shows the data that was first started. Coming up to a more current period, and dealing with one of the items which we were concerned with, days suitable for field work, we find that here in central Indiana for the week of May 15, 1970, approximately 28% of the time was suitable for the farmers to be in the field. In other words, that's about two days out of the seven during the week. By that time of the year, 35% of our corn had been planted. As we go about this business of sizing machinery to do a man's job, we're quite concerned as to how date of planting affects yields. To find out, let's ask Dr. Bill Rice, our extension agronomist. Bill? Well, Howard, I'll certainly agree with you that date of planting plays a very important part in terms of producing top corn yields. Now, if you remember, about five weeks ago, we were out here at this very plot, and we looked at three dates of planting. The first one was May 3rd. The second planting date was May 17th. And then the last one was June 1. You can't really tell too much right now, other than the fact that this June 1 planting date has not tasseled, which uh, indicates it's going to have a rather severe yield reduction. Well, Bill, what kind of experience do you have from your research results? Well, Howard, I've got some nine years summary information to show on this chart. You'll notice that we normally get our highest yields with late April planting dates, uh, but we also get almost comparable yields uh, if we can get our corn planted within the first 10 days of May. Uh, but once we get down into the middle of May, Yields are beginning to decline rapidly, and by the time we get to the end of May, first part of June, we have some rather severe yield reductions. Bill, what kind of a year is this? Are the yields going to be typical? Well, Howard, we've got same planting dates in here as I've showed on the chart, but we'll have to wait until this fall to see what kind of yield reductions or yield levels we have. Using days suitable for work from Dr. Park, and yields from Dr. Rice, we have budgeted farms of various sizes with various sets of equipment. One such set will complete planting in eight working days. Here then is an eight-day planting system and beginning on April 26th in each of the last 21 years, notice when planting would have been completed. For example, in 1966, it took 31 days to get eight good days. On the other hand, 1968 was a very favorable year. In the first 10 days, there were eight days suitable for planting. Remember 1968 because it rained and rained so that with another set of machinery, what we call here a 12-day planting system. In 1968, starting on April 26, it was not until the 1st of June that planting would have been completed. Based on 21 years 
of days suitable for work and the yields for various planting dates, we have found that an eight-day planting system is more timely and more profitable than a 12-day system. For your own farm, if you are in doubt about which size equipment to use, consider using the larger size. Determining the best way to operate a crop farm is a question that many people have. We wrote a computer program to help us answer this question. The gentleman who said, if you can describe it, we can program it, is Dr. Will Candler. Will, tell us, how do you do it? Well, we've got to do three things. Firstly, we've got to get an accurate description of the farmer's problem. Secondly, we've got to put this into the computer in a way that the computer can solve the problem. And thirdly, we've got to get a clear description of the computer solution in terms that the farmer can understand. Now then, <coughs> let's first look at the way in which we get this information ready for the computer to solve the problem. We build a big table. Mathematicians call it a matrix, but it's just a big table. And for each way of growing a crop, we allocate a column in the table. We give this column to the particular crop, and all the information on that crop is in this column. In particular, the model we built here at Purdue, we grew corn, but we grew it in 36 ways. We had six planting periods, three harvesting periods, and then the corn could be dried on the farm or sent to the elevator. That was six by three by two, it was 36 ways in which we could grow corn. So we had, in fact, 36 columns here for growing corn, one to 36. For any one of those ways of growing corn, we put all the relevant information in that column. If we wanted to add another crop, if we were in another district, we wanted to add another crop, such as soybeans, we would give that column, give a new column to soybeans, and put the soybean information down that column. At the same time, in addition to the crops that the farmer can grow, we've got to take account of the things which hold up his production, his restrictions, the amount of land he's got, the amount of land he can rent, the amount of labor he can get, the amount of time he can work in the spring and in the fall by individual time periods. And these information on these restrictions, these restrictions we put along the rows. For instance, if we're worried about the amount of labor he has in May, we allocate or give a whole row to the description of May labor. And all of the information on May labor is now going to be in this row. So that when we think about this new crop soybeans, if it requires May labor, we put the information in this intersection here of the soybean column with the May labor row. And in this way, we can take the information that the farmer gives us, gives us and it has a home in this table. The computer then sorts through all these crops that could be grown and finds the most profitable combination. Now this, we can think of this as the computer's work here. And we've had this computer programs, we've had these computer programs for 15 years or so. You look back in the farmer magazines and you can see pictures there of farmers planning with the computer. And the picture has a a computer installation and a happy professor and a couple of puzzled farmers. But in fact, that hasn't really been used. It's um, because we always had to have the professor interpret the farmer's problem to the computer and the professor interpret the computer result to the farmer. And quite frankly, the professors weren't very good at this. Now we've turned the pr responsibility over to the computer. And the new features are that we've added input forms which are tailored to the farmer language, not the computer language, to farmer language, and we give the computer now the responsibility for translating that farmer information into language that the computer itself can understand and use. In the same way, when we get to a computer solution, we've designed output forms so we can take the computer solution and turn it into tables that are easily understood. And it's this new emphasis on the input form convenient to the farmer and the output form clearly understandable by the farmer that I think means we've got a new generation of computer-assisted management tools available to farmers and I think this generation is going to be widely accepted. This Purdue model covers the crops 
of corn, soybeans, and wheat for Indiana conditions. Of course, farmers throughout the Corn Belt have used this with their own figures. It would be possible to program and test a model for corn, sorghum, and cotton, or tobacco and peanuts, or if you will, for flax, rapeseed, and durum, either with irrigation or without it. To communicate with farmers, we conduct many workshops. Together, we learn how to drive this new machine. First, farmers decide what questions they want answered. Then, they fill out the input forms. These are sent to the key punch room, the cards go on to the computer, and finally, the solutions come back and are analyzed. This computer program was written for farmers. Let's visit with some farmers who have used the program. Harry Young is an innovative farmer in southwestern Kentucky. Harry, tell us about your operation. Well, I operate about 1,235 acres of land producing corn, small grain, and soybeans. I produce the soybeans double crop behind the small grain, and that way I wind up with about 1,800 acres of grain crops on the 1,200 acres of land. Now, Harry, when did you start the uh, no-till? I started with no-till corn in 1962. In 1967, I planted my first no-till double crop soybeans. And since that time, I've been all the way with no-till. How many acres of no-till soybeans were planted here in Christian County this year? Uh, in excess of 40,000 acres of yeah. no-till soybeans. Well, now, Harry, you and I met about a year ago. Uh, we did some computer budgeting at that time. Mm -hmm. One of the things I remember was you had about enough machinery for 600 acres of Indiana land, crop land, yet you're doing 1,800 acres You've really spread out your workload. What did you find in the computer budget? Well, I found uh, for most profit uh, opportunity that I did need some more capacity in harvesting and planting, and also to improve my timeliness somewhat. Uh, as a result, I have added uh, grain bins. I've added a continuous flow dryer, which allows me to harvest my wheat and barley a little bit earlier, and thereby get my double crop beans planted sooner. I have gone in with a neighbor, and uh, we have bought a second uh, no-till planter together, and we have bought a second sprayer together. Also, I have been hiring in some uh, combining to help me out with the harvest, particularly soybean harvest, and uh, I have learned that uh, perhaps I need a second combine of my own. And as a result, uh, next year I probably will have one, and therefore I'm now involved in a long process of bickering with uh, my machinery dealer. <laughs> Next, we travel to a much smaller farm in central Indiana near Shelbyville. Harry Everhart had 350 acres of corn when he attended one of our earlier workshops. Harry, do you remember the workshop I went to three years ago at Purdue? Sure do, Harry, right after you just went in some more land. That's mm -hmm. right, and um, I wanted to go up and see if I had the time to do it and if I had the machinery to do it. So I came home and I got the results and I came home and I found out I had enough planting equipment, enough cultivating equipment, but it was short on harvesting equipment. Harry, now what did you decide about that harvesting bottleneck you discovered? Well, I came home and I didn't want to um, trade combines. I had one that wasn't too old and so I looked around and I found a neighbor that only had about 200 acres and sold seed corn, so he didn't want to expand his acreage. He had a new machine and um, I hired him in early rather than late because uh, I knew I had more than I could do and it worked out real good. When did you start to uh, harvest corn in here home? Well, I started at 30 percent. He didn't want to put his in until it was 25. And I had him in at 30 percent and this way I was caught back up to where I could finish with my own machinery by the time his got to 25. Now, you started at 30% moisture. How has that worked out over the years? Howard, I like to start harvesting corn at 30% because um, it's better weather in the early part of the fall. 
for one reason. Another reason, it seems we get more corn out of the field in September than any other time. We try to get all in we can early that we don't have storage for. And by the time the price break comes in the fall, why, then we can go ahead and fill our bins and sell it for or either contract it for later or January, February, March, whenever we want to sell it. In La Crosse, Indiana, several farmers work together to harvest, dry, and store their 3,000 plus acres of corn. John McCormick farms in La Crosse, Indiana. He had 460 acres when he came to his first corn workshop with three of his neighbors. Remember that first session, Joe? Yes, sir, it was 1968, summer 1968. As I remember, you fellas stayed around after the workshop even. Right, it was really interesting, and we found out there was some things that we could use. You had made a lot of computer budgets that time. What kind of combinations did you make? Well, not really conceivable. <laughs> well, we ended up that with one or two guys going together with their machine, and we ended up with everybody uh, together, all the machinery together. When you put all your machinery together and your labor and so forth, what did you find? We found we could find about an additional thousand acres, and all the machinery we needed to be four rows of corn planter. Did you ever get to use that plan, Joe? Well, I always kept it in mind, and three years later, we found 960 acres of immediate area that was up for rent, so we rented it. How long did it take you to put this together? Two or three days. Did you have a good year? Okay, pretty good. I you did. Before we leave Indiana, let's pick up a statement that Steve and Millard Eck gave us about machinery. Years ago, I believe people were concerned with getting out of debt. I'm not necessarily concerned with getting out of debt as long as I can grow. What I'm interested in is managing my debt. I think a basic philosophy has changed. That we used to think that we had to use everything until it was completely wore out. Now then we find that it's a matter of managing the equipment which you have, and if you can better yourself by trading or getting other, well, we do this rather before the equipment is wore out. Dick Rolfe and I grew up in the same county. He now farms 2,000 acres here in Clinton County, Ohio. Rick, you've done a lot of computer budgeting, been to our top farmer workshop over at Purdue. Tell us, what have you learned? I think, Howard, uh, since the first workshop that we have learned uh, a lot of things, such as work days, planting periods, harvesting periods, uh, bottlenecks and drying, uh, what to expect in an average year, an abnormal year, being wet, being dry, uh, several things. What changes have you made? Well, Howard, we've run uh, perhaps 75, 80 uh, runs on the linear programming. One of the things that it suggested was that uh, we size the machinery. Well, now, you made some changes, Dick. Yes, we made some drastic changes compared to most farmers uh, in that we had a farm sale and sold the equipment that we had, not that we might quit, but in essence to start over and use the equipment size that the programming suggested. Uh, one thing, for instance, uh, we replaced the two eight-row planters with one 12-row planter. Another thing uh, we've done, we've replaced uh, a 110 horsepower tractor with a 165, 70 horsepower tractor. We feel like that labor-wise, uh, we're replacing some men, picking up the cost of the machinery, fitting into planning periods of normal years. As I recall, that particular year, we were both surprised on the crop mix that you had planned for the next spring. The computer told us something. What was it? Yes, and I think this can happen on a yearly basis, but that particular year, while with the price of, of uh, corn and beans, um, it was suggesting that we probably could go corn that year. I think this decision will be made from year to year, probably. Now then, Dick, you've done something here with forced planting. What is this? Well, it's simply a method, Howard, where the, you fellows talk about eight-day planting. We feel that we can increase our planting period from 12 to 14 days, still get it in uh, uh, by the 10th of May. And uh, 
in all of the years of our forest planting, uh, we've not had yield losses. Uh, all we've had is more planting days by using it. It seems to me like you've got some new numbers to put in our budget. Yes, uh, I think that the program will look completely different when we feed the extra days into your program this time. What's the future? Certainly more computer programs covering more phases of farm management. Computer networks are being formed. One network in Virginia and a number of eastern states uses teletype terminals like this one. In the upper Midwest, headquartered in Michigan, is a touch-tone phone network that reaches into Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and other states and Canada. This is the University of Michigan Terminal System. You want program 35 and has formed this late. We have made three points. First, use big machinery. Somehow, figure out how to gain the productivity cost advantages that are possible when you use large equipment. Second, be timely. Penalties for late planting and harvesting are severe. The payoff you gain by using the larger size of equipment is often enough to cover its extra cost. Third, test before you invest. Use this computer program, this new hired hand, to help you decide the best way to operate your farm. We believe that our management work with farmers using the computer can be summarized in one word, opportunity. Opportunity for more precise management decisions and opportunity for more productive education programs. Here at Purdue, we teach farmers how to drive this new machine. We teach them how to individualize our model to fit their situation, so as to provide answers for their real management questions. For more information, please write us. Agricultural Economics Department, Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana.